Good afternoon. For those of you who work with us this morning, I'm Mike Smith, I'm the program moderator, uh, sometimes called Trail Boss on this program. And um, thank you for coming back this afternoon. Thank you for coming this afternoon. And some of you were over at our luncheon and lecture, which was very interesting. And um, we're covering a lot of things today. We're covering the High Plains. We're covering Mari Sandoz, the writer of the High Plains. We're covering how she is taught and how the High Plains are taught here at uh, Shadron State College. But this afternoon, we're gonna talk about the High Plains. Um, this building is the Mari Sandoz High Plains Center. And we've got three members of the science faculty here at um, Shadron State College who are gonna share their information with us. If I can find their bios, I will introduce them. Excuse Michael Lighty is with us here to on, on their far right. Mike is committed to a life of science since the age of five. Grew up in North Dakota, um, became very interested in science. Among his role models are Harrison Schmidt, the first geologist to walk on the moon. But he picked geology as a vocation because of the field trips. Field trips are events like like-minded geo-geeks could share the wonders of a world much bigger and much older than humanly imaginable and somehow think that was normal. And I think that um, that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Started his professional life as an oil field geologist, never intended to be a teacher like his father was a teacher, but fell in the profession because that's where the interesting jobs were. Academia is where basic research is done. Teacher la teaching later became a passion for Mike. He realized that most people don't have the benefits of growing up like his. And some people don't automatically understand the connections of the natural world and therefore don't understand the consequences of their actions. Among his accomplishments is partnering with colleagues to develop the hybrid partially online geoscience program here at Shadron State College, including an annual field camp. Before he leaves this world, and we hope that's not soon, he hopes to make small strides towards alleviating the climate crisis. Next, Steve Rolsmeyer. Steve grew up near Seward, Nebraska, which is way down state, and did not show much interest in plants till his senior year in high school when he made a plant collection for advanced biology and continued to collect as a hobby after graduation. As an undergrad at Doan College, he worked extensively with the college historical herbarium and eventually got a job working weekends in the university herbarium at UNL. A couple of years after finishing a master's degree at the university, he got an opportunity to spend a summer collecting on the Pine Ridge in 1991 and spent most of, much of his off time volunteering for the Ron Whedon, for Ron Whedon in Shadron State College Herbarium. That turned into a yearly gig and eventually Ron coaxed his wife Susan to set up a computerized database for the Shadron State Herbarium in 2003. They both left for Kansas, but three years into, let me see, uh, they both left for Kansas, let me start again, both left for Kansas State University for Susan to complete a PhD in 2007, but thought that they would return when she finished. Three years into the program, Ron Whedon died unexpectedly and Steve was asked to cover one of his fall courses and manage the herbarium. He was hired as a full-time director of the High Plains Herbarium, as it now, now named, uh, and following fall. Since then, they have added over 10,000, yes, that's 10,000 specimens to the collection, are completing digitization of our, plants, of our plant specimen records, which can be accessed online through the, Great, through the Northern Great Plains Herbarium portal. Great resource, I suspect that's here. I use it every day. Every day. Well, that keeps it going. Teresa Frank is our third presenter, Shadron State College professor. Dr. Teresa J. Frank teaches courses in wildlife management and range program at the school. She graduated from the University of Nebraska Lincoln with a Bachelor of Science in Fisheries and Wildlife Biology in 2001. In 2004, she earned her Master of Science in Wildlife and Fishery Science. And in 2008, her directorate, her doctorate in wildlife science, both at South Dakota State University. Teresa joined the CSA range program in 2008. Her research, research interests focus on mountain lions, bighorn sheep, swift fox, and spotted skunk. I think I could do without the last one. 
She lives with her husband, E.J., and daughters, Willow and Cedar, on a small ranch south of Hay Springs, and tell me, tells me later this afternoon she's going to be working cattle. <laughs> They're correct. So we want to talk about the High Plains today, and we don't, we're not going to do this with slides and pictures, although it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, we really want to talk about the past, what this place was like in the past. Maybe they'll focus on the time that the Native Americans first came here and settled and lived and roamed on these plains. And then what it's like today, and maybe most importantly, what, we've, what we see as it might be like in the future. So I guess the first question I would ask is, what is the High Plains, where is it at, and how do we describe it? Mike, you brought the, uh, the slide. Well, I brought some uh, visuals, visuals here, and I guess, um, If I could hold this, is this doing good? Need it closer. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, I only have one hand here, but I can hold it. Um, but the uh, okay, there's the there's the map. I can pass this around actually. But the um, the high plains is is the black area, at least the um, the version of it that I'm kind of familiar with. So. Um, Bob Diffendahl was is a professor at the University of Nebraska, uh, the um, and he was my mentor when I was there as a master's student many many years ago, and he uh, he drew this map in the black outlined area it is the High Plains Aquifer, the Ogallala Aquifer same thing just the, the semantic really no difference, um, so the. He defines the High Plains as the presence of the High Plains Aquifer. And um, that is kind of an interesting uh, conclusion because it just says how important water is for everything people do here. Um, I, I, just, I just read um, Old Jewels, you know, in, to learn something about Marty Sando before I came here. And um, you could pass it around if you want. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out, you know, everything, everything there is about water, right? Growing, trying to grow trees, trying, trying to, you know, deal with the weather, dealing with um, the, uh, you know, the landscape. And people, people move to places because they have uh, resources there. And the most important resource, of course, is water, and you know, a safe place to live. And there's, um, there's lots to. Uh, Lots embedded in that. So the High Plains is the um, High Plains Aquifer. That um, that region there, that black outline region, is the Ogallala Formation. So it's actually a physical body of rock. It's a big blob of sandstone that was shed off of the Rockies when the Rockies um, uplifted and eroded. And so that's a big big apron, and it's actually a big slanted. Um, we look kind of a living a fan because um, the elevation at the top of this is over 5,000 feet, over a mile high um, near Harrison, Nebraska, and the eastern edge of that near Omaha is less than 1,000 feet. So the 4,000 feet of slope on top of that thing. So it's actually this big ramp. And I always tell my students that Nebraska is a big ramp and it's a big, big game plank. Um, so I guess. You know, actually, what I'm saying about the High Plains is that's that's what it is. It's 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 the same thing as the aquifer that underlies it. So and it covers uh, North, South Dakota or Nebraska and South. Um, so seven states it covers Nebraska, South Dakota, Nebraska. almost all of Nebraska. The other thing about the the, um, the High Plains and the High Plains aquifer is it comes abruptly to an end right here. In Shed. If you look out the uh, look out here to the south, you see this big sea on the side of the high plains. It kind of reminds you of cut here. <laughs> it's actually li literally the side of the high plains, and the high plains is leaking its water out the north end, and that's why we have these springs and all this all the all the rivers along here, the creeks, Shadow Creek, Borough Creek. They're all spring-fed because the High Plains Aquifer is leaking off its, off its uh, eroded north edge. And that's kind of like, here we are, you know, kind of just 
watching that take place. It's kind of an interesting phenomenon. Interesting. So the C doesn't stand for what the parents tell their children when they come here? Do better than that? <laughs> so, I don't know. It's universal. <laughs> universal. Well, um, okay, so we have the aquifer, we have the, the, the land above the aquifer. You said one thing about how that land was formed, the, the slough off, if you will, from the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. So if you've got, um, uh, you go south of here and you've got Chimney Rock, you've got, um, you've got uh, Castle Rock and all those high bluffs. Yep. So when did, when did the land, when did it ero everything erode away down to sort of the level we're at now? There's maybe millions of years, which can be confusing to me. Yeah, well, the, the Rockies got done uplifting maybe 50 million years ago. 50 million. And then at that point, the, the thought is that they were eroded very fast. And there was this blanket um, of debris that just buried them. So if you were here 50 million years ago, uh, you'd look out toward um, the front range, and you'd just see this gentle rise. And so like, what's today 13,000 feet in elevation has just been basically part of the plane. So the, there's, there's a lot of evidence for that, because if you go to these high, if you go to high mountain valleys, you can find the remnants of the overall formation up there at high elevation. It's been eroded away. So 20 million years ago, during the Miocene, there was a, a bunch of stuff going on in the, in the west, uh, Pacific, that caused the entire west to uplift. So the, the Rockies were um, complexly de deformed, but they weren't uplifted, they weren't high yet. And at that point, everything was lifted up 10,000 feet, maybe. And all these high sediments then became unstable. And then started coming down. So the Platte River and the Colorado River, um, all these rivers eroded that stack of sediments and then started cutting down. Um, they're still cutting down today, right? They're, they're removing that. We don't have any deposition taking place. So then the North Platte River came through, and when the, what the North Platte River didn't remove, left behind is Chimney Rock and Scotts Bluff and all that stuff. And um, so, how, how many years has it been that the current, um, what we see today, is, is you know, we were how, how many years ago would we have to be here to see what we do today? See, several million. Well, you'll never see the same thing tomorrow. Well, true. I mean, it's it's evolving. So. We're, we're at you know, one little brief snapshot in time. It's never looked like this before. It never looked like this again. Well, we see that we're finding today that people came, people uh, uh, moved into the into the North America, into parts west of here, here as many as 30,000 years ago. So what would they have found here in terms of plants or animals? What, what, uh, what, Teresa, what? Would they still be chasing those, those big things, which you now see at, at uh, Moral Hall, for example? Passing, um, he's passing the mic. Wow, yeah, thanks for that one, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, so there's huge transitions which happened, right? Um, the modern day, most of the modern day mammals that we see here um, were ones that uh, came over, essentially the Bering Land Bridge about 12,000 years ago. Okay. Um, when we're talking about things like uh, bighorn sheep, so those would be things that would be relatively recent. I, um, and those are the mammals that I study. <laughs> uh, obviously before that we had things like mastodons and camels and the, you know, a variety of different horses, but um, that would probably be a better question when we're speaking of that portion of time would be a better question for Mike. Um, I don't know, Steve, what your thoughts are in terms of plants. Well, I have, I, I have some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing is, uh, we've known that there's been grassland in this area for a very long time. Um, there are examples of what are called phytoliths, little crystals that are found in grasses going back, oh goodness, millions of years, long before humans were here. Um, so we, we've had grassland in here, we've had uh, plants and animals, well, grasses among, and other plants adapted to grassland, uh, animals that uh, utilize grassland for a very long time. Um, 
Most of the plant species that are in the High Plains originated actually in the Mexican highlands. That seems to be uh, the epicenter of where that radiation of plants that eventually spread northward came to. In fact, if you, if you drive from, uh, from here, the north edge of the plains, from the sea over here, southward toward Texas, you'll, you'll eventually encounter more and more native species the farther south you go. So, um, yeah, we, we, uh, all of that probably was in place 30,000 years ago. So we, we uh, had a certain amount of plant diversity depending on where you were uh, in the plains and, of course, the animals that went along with that. Since one of the things we see, of course, is that if you go over to the uh, Geology Museum before Robinson State Park, you can see evidence of those paleo, what's the word I'm trying to say, uh, very prehistoric animals that lived in this area. Then people came into the area, uh, been a long years. We're finding that people came to North America earlier and earlier than we used to think. When I, even when I was working 10 years ago, the average thing was say, well, there were people moved into North America about 12, 13,000 years ago. And new geology, or excuse me, new archaeology is now showing that it may have been as early as 30,000 years ago. So what was here that allowed them to live here? The, the modern day animals and the plants that already had come in. Steve, you're saying the plants had already come up into this area yeah. that provided it, grazing it, for... It does seem the, plant, the animals are where the plants are. So yeah, basically, right. that's where, where everything starts. But yeah, it, I'll, I'll be certainly... Uh, 30,000 years ago, we would have had grassland. It would have been a little different, though, in some ways. Um, there's a place in the uh, sand hills. Uh, there's occasionally these, these fins, which are kind of like bogs, that have layers of peat that go back, in some cases, almost to the last, or near the end of the last ice age. Um, there are folks who have done cores into these fins, these sediments, um, looking for any evidence of what was around at that time. Uh, Jumbo Finn in uh, Cherry County has sediments that, that, that are probably at least at the bottom of the fin, 12 to 13, somewhere in the 12,000 to 13,000 year old range. You know, since these peat is basically partially broken down plant material, and given that it's, it's from plants, you can carbon date it to get an idea how old it is. Uh, the most common microfossil they find in those sediments are, is spruce pollen. Spruce. So um, we know at least at one time, we, we certainly had grass in the area, but at one time we may have had something more like a spruce savanna in the time of the, uh, the mammoth, the mastodon, et cetera, where you had grassland with scattered spruce trees. We don't really have anything on earth that's quite equivalent to that. So a little um, different than northern Canada, for example, is today? A, a little bit so, and I think part of that's just simply because uh, back at the time you had this enormous ice sheet down into an area that would normally have a temperate climate. And when you do that, you get all kinds of strange things you wouldn't expect to see. So was this, were the High Plains ever glaciated? Covered um, by glaciers? Not the north. Not here, no. No, no. Yeah. east of here. Uh, Missouri River is kind of like the ice front. Okay. So, so everything north and east of the Missouri <laughs> was probably uh, glaciated at one time, but, but not here. Yeah, where I grew up in, in Illinois, we had at least four, four different glaciers came through and we had evidence of that, but it's very different here from that point of view. But it so, would have been a lot cooler here, cooler and wetter. Even because of the ice. Because, because of the, the whole climate was cooler to allow the ice to form. We were all cold in here yesterday. We had a board meeting. Everybody's complaining how cold it was. I didn't think I could do with a glacier, though. I think it was uh, HVAC, <laughs> but um, you know, we, it. We, we just put on our coats and carried on. So this area would have been hospitable to those early people? Or they would have had to make a lot of, would they have been challenged by it? Um, 10,000, 7,000, 5,000, 1,000 years ago, how do you see it? I know nothing about this, but I'm suspecting that <laughs> climate has always been challenging. Okay. And it was challenging back then. And were there more or less than today? I don't know. I suspect if there's more available moisture, maybe it was a little bit nicer, uh, able to grow crops, maybe to grow plants. And less we do know, Steve. 
Um, one thing that I, I think was uh, the, the folks who first came out here had to face is that they didn't probably have quite the supply of food plants that humans were used to from the old world. Um, we don't realize this sometimes. Most of our food crops come from Eurasia, from the old world and places like that. Uh, and this extends even to things like uh, mushrooms. My, my wife did some of her thesis work in Russia. And, you know, um, she was an American in Russia back about 15, 20 years ago. Russian students felt comfortable asking their, their uncomfortable questions about Americans to her. And they said uh, something like, uh, Susan, that's her name. Susan, is it true in America people buy mushrooms at the supermarket? That's unheard of there because you can just go out into the woods and gather nearly every type of mushroom that you run across as edible. We don't quite have the same situation here. You have to be very careful if you're collecting mushrooms. So finding food, finding something uh, to sustain you would have been a huge challenge, I think, to the first people out here, but they managed. Let's talk about the bison, uh, which became the staple of uh, livelihood for <laughs> Native Americans, uh, the descendants of those early, early people. And what can you tell us about the bison that we may not know, or mm. we may want to know? Yeah, I, I have some interesting things. Um, so uh, there was a, a paper that was published by Josh Millspa a few years ago. He was a professor at the time that was out of the University of Missouri. And um, he was doing some research for the Park Service. And I had actually done my PhD work up at Badlands National Park. And the Park Service kept going to Dr. Millspa and they would say, we need to know how to manage our bison herds. And he was like, well, okay, like at what point in time do you want to manage them? And they said, well, was there, is there ever been a difference in time? And so uh, Josh, Dr. Millspa and his graduate students started doing some digging and um, started looking through some archeological sites and where they were able to um, find remains of bison where they could determine gender as well as age, right? And so what they had found was pretty interesting in terms of the way uh, populations of bison were structured pre-horse, so pre-Native um, pre Americans having horses versus post-horse. So um, our speaker earlier was talking about the um, buffalo jumps or the bison jumps, right? And so pre-horse, that was one of the mechanisms that was used to harvest um, bison. And so it was just a random sampling of whatever would jump over the cliff, right? Um, what they found post horse, in fact, was that they were actually selecting for specific gender as well as age group. So they would target um, young female bison. So typically around two to three years of age because they were much more docile uh, in terms of their, um, the ability to hunt them when you're hunting them on a horse and in close proximity to them, running at very rapid speeds, they were more docile. And then also the hides on the young cows were much easier to process, to tan, in comparison with other um, aged uh, cows as well as with bulls. And so, um, so then when it comes back to this management question about, you know, with the park service, so how do we manage them? And so they're like, we well, have to make these decisions. Do you want to manage them pre-horse pre -horse or post-horse? But um, yeah, so it, it's quite interesting. And when we look at really the wildlife associated with the Great Plains, the dynamic factors that all of these species evolved with were grazing <coughs> as well as fire. And we have on the landscape still grazers uh, there's some debate on whether or not the grazers act the same way. So these grazers that we have from Eurasia, do they graze the same way that bison do? Um, and then also the lack of fire has uh, caused some major modifications, even modifications that uh, would have been able to be observed looking from when Mari Sandos was here versus now. And that primarily, and I don't know if Steve's going to agree with me, but uh, the encroachment of woody veg vegetation. So you're yeah, going to throw stuff at me? <laughs> well, yeah. I think that's the next question is, is I know, well, first I will comment that um, I think people are, uh, scholars are learning more and more about the kinds of, of um, 
I'm quite sure what the word, uh, management uh, or changes in, in the environment, the physical environment that the Native American people um, were made um, in terms of the use of fire, that's always talked about. And now you've added that even, even in terms of how they managed the bison and I suspect in how they developed and developed their horse herds. Uh, uh, Native tribes um, often, and as Pierce are, are said to be uh, one of the, uh, and the Cayuse, be very effective um, breeders and uh, of, of horse of horses it's suited for their uses. And um, so these aren't people who are necessarily just wandering around out there trying to find something to eat. They're actively actively interacting with and changing their environment. Yeah, so um, Matt, uh, Dr. Evertson, and I, <clears throat> because he always brings interesting things for us to read in class. Sure. Uh, so he had brought um, the uh, popular press book, um, Great Plains Indians, is that what it's called, by uh, Dr. Wishart. And uh, we were reading portions of that in class, and uh, Dr. Wishart in there just makes this blanket statement about how it was um, the the presence of horses from native people that caused the initial decline of bison in the Great Plains. And I got so mad and I threw the book because there was not a scientific source. There was not a citation. There was not a citation. And never in my studies had I ever heard that claim before. And so I've been asking range ecologists and other historians about this claim. You know, is there any evidence to indicate this? And apparently Dr. Wishart had actually gone through and done some calculations based upon the different bands and the tribes and the number of horses that would have been associated with each um, and felt it's compelling enough that with the amount of forage that's consumed by horses that indeed they could have. And as I speak to other range ecologists, it's kind of brewing in the back of their head that they're saying maybe this could have been a competition issue. So. I oh, don't know, but thanks to Matt, it's this uh, rabbit hole that I seem to be going down all the time. Those are all interesting questions. Of course, farmers learned that uh, when they could get rid of the horses and get a tractor, they saved a lot of acreage that they didn't have to raise oats on, and they didn't have to raise their forage for their horses. However, they had to buy gas. They didn't realize at the time it was going to cost them $3.87 a, ga a gallon if you could find it. But uh, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, what Mari would have seen here, Mari Sandals would have seen here, let's say at 1900, different than what um, Native people would have seen here in, let's say, 1875, uh, 1775. Mm -hmm. And um, woody plants and other invasives? Um, 1900. Yeah, um, see, 19, you know, well, I, let's say early 20th century when Mari lived. Okay. That's how focus in her lifetime. I remember once seeing a, um, a picture that was taken down from Shabbard in the, in the 1880s, taken going down Main Street toward what is now Sea Hill, and uh, there's not a, a tree to be seen on any of those areas. Uh, in fact, in around 1900, uh, we, we did have a lot of tree cutting in this part of the world, um, which... Uh, being that a lot of that happened at the same time, one of the things we've been left with are uh, stands of pines that are about the same height today. Uh, so they have interlocking canopies. And um, this is a fire adapted landscape. Uh, and when fire runs through an area that has a lot of trees the same size close together, we've seen the outcome. Here, if you've been in Chadron for any length of time, both in 2006 and mm -hmm. 2012. So. Um, not, not as many trees in the early 20th century. One of the things in my readings of, play, of people observing plants in the plains that I thought was remarkable is that uh, there were hardly any red cedars in a lot of the plains. People were, um, they, they always made a big deal when they found a patch of red cedar growing somewhere. This is something now that we, we've been told is, is a horrible weed. It's a native tree but in certain parts of the state, it's just taking over. Um, back then, it was something you were very excited to see. So, they used um, for Christmas trees. Yeah, I, I've tried using for Christmas trees. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, it's it's we are much more wood wooded than we were, I think, in uh, in Mari's time, certainly. 
So, question for those of you in the audience who studied Mari: How does she see the landscape? Any comment? Uh, I just remember in old jewels, she writes about fires, mm -hmm. and so it was out of the cedars of Bay. Uh, and now that we have more fire. We, we would have had pines in various places around here. Um, they would not have all been the same size. And occasionally you'd get a, a ground level fire in the grasses that would take out the seedlings every about 10 to 15 years. So you'd have some that would survive to get big. Um, and you'd have kind of an open canopy with, um, with different sized trees, which seems to stay, withstand fire pretty well, so. Donovan's, someone mentioned this morning, um, the, 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 it's the uh, treaty tree. Who mentioned that? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very, very clear. And, and that's the one perhaps out here by Fort Robinson where the uh, great con congregation of, of tribes were for the treaty. So that was a tree that people could come from miles around to identify and say, that's where we're going. You see that tree? You would say, I want to go to a certain tree today. Yeah, it might be a little hard to find that. It might be a little hard to find that. So this this landscape, this place, this high plains changed. Changed. Um, anything you look at is, is, a, is a place in time. Um, and Mari's time was different. And, uh, go ahead, Mary. Or, uh, Teresa. I, uh, yeah, so the other thing I think that's probably a really big one um, from a wildlife perspective is in addition to bison, so we had um, the massive eradication of large carnivores, which happened in the Great Plains, in the Northern Great Plains, right? And so um, historically, when we would have looked at places like Nebraska, specifically in uh, the western part of the state, so um, we would have had this open canopy forest with lots of um, shrubs in the understory that were berry producing. So we would have had populations of black bear that would have been here. Out on the plains, we would have had populations of grizzly bears, mm -hmm. um, as well as elk, which were a, a plain species. Um, we would have had things like mountain lions, and we would have had a lot fewer species like uh, coyotes, okay? Um, because of mesopredator release, once we got rid of these large carnivores then, um, there are no predators to speak of, of these mesopredators like coyotes, uh, raccoons, etc. And so you have this massive um, uh, inputs, I guess, of them now becoming the top carnivores and subsequently have had um, devastating effects on smaller carnivores such as the swift fox, which is one of the species that I'm very interested in that's a prairie obligate, it hates trees. Um, and its primary predator, its primary threat are roads, um, conversion to agriculture, and coyotes. So, there's that. There's my plug on swift fox. Very good. Well done. <laughs> so we had a situation in which Native people came, Native American people came here, relied on some of these species, and hunted some of these species. Um, and then we had explorers showed up, and they had their, their writings, and. Uh, are filled with uh, adventures of running into grizzly bears. The great, and they're, they're really interesting writings. If you've, if you've seen any of the movies, why some things, they're, they're pretty scary. Then who showed up? Farmers and ranchers. Farmers and ranchers brought what? Domestic animals, cattle and sheep, horses. And all of a sudden, the, the food source for one group of people became a threat or another source, another group of people. Is that, is that a legitimate way to look at all of this? So, yeah. Yeah. so those species disappeared. Uh, the wolf, the wolf was the one that's always talked about. Uh, there was all the bounty on a wolf, on um, wolves were there none. Old Jules was always shooting after shooting wolves or trying to shoot wolves. Um, coyotes, probably shot anything he could find, but uh, uh, being a, such an interesting person. Um, but, uh, but uh, uh, one of my favorite people in all, all, all of all, all literature. Um, but they also brought plants. And what, what were some of the key plants that they brought? Uh, they, they brought many of the same sorts of things that we grow today. They're probably a little more diverse, you know, barley, flax. If you look at, um, uh, I, I worked in the herbarium at the University of Lincoln where there's uh, specimens 
that were commonly cultivated in the, around the turn of the 20th century. And you saw all kinds of things, flax, barley, um, a lot more oats than we have now. There was really a lot more diversity. People were trying to figure out what would grow where. Um, but along with those plants, they also brought some things in that um, maybe they didn't intend to. Uh, one of the things we see is a lot of our invasive plants, a lot of our spe weed species, came over with, sometimes by um, accident, uh, when farmers would buy um, cheap seed from Europe in the early 20th century. There were many people, many botanists especially, criticizing these farmers for being so careless. All kinds of weeds from Europe came with. Some of them didn't stick around, but few did. Maybe for every uh, 10 that came over, maybe one stuck around. And eventually, I think um, from what I've seen, maybe it takes about 30 years for something to get introduced that's going to be invasive to become invasive. Those things take over and um, start causing problems in the areas that were not already converted to row crops and places like that. So, so some of them ended up in my garden, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the thing is, there were also, I think the native people to some extent did the same thing. There are plants that we know are native in places like Central America. So there, there's a little tiny fleshy leaved thing called purslane. Oh, yes. Nasty weed in my, my garden beds at home. Yes. Uh, it's edible, I'm told. I don't think it tastes that good. But um, it was a pre-Columbian introduction, apparently, by uh, people bringing through trade things up from the southern latitudes into this part of the world. So as horses came north, other things came north. Absolutely. Oh, interesting. interesting. Well, Mike, tell us a little bit about um, ongoing changes in the geology that we see here, other than the fact that it's very slow. Or is it very slow? Things over the last 100, 150 years. What, what would, what well, would what's, somebody what's see? Changing, what's changing now is the climate. You know? Is it what? The climate. The climate. Let's talk about climate. We've had, uh, you know, since the industrial age, we've had profound changes in the climate. So it's been, you know, how do you adapt to that? We have the, the largest mass extinction uh, ever taking place, ever happening on Earth is taking place right now. You know, this beats the one that the great dying in the Paleozoic and the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs and you know, everything. The rate, you know, the rate is so fast uh, in only a few hundred years. And so that's one of, the, one of the big things that's changing right now. And the question is, you know, how do we adapt to that? Uh, you know, climate change has always happened in the past and it's, we haven't been around to experience it. And so it hasn't been the kind of thing that's I mean, this is a human tragedy, right? Because you know, it can involve, you know, people not finding enough food and not finding places, safe places to live, and that kind of thing, as a result of a changing climate. I think one example that I'm somewhat familiar with here uh, in the past in Nebraska is around the year 1200, a uh, long period of drought. Um, and the people who were living in Nebraska at that time, let's say along the Platte and the Republican rivers, the Blue, um, they picked up and they moved north to South Dakota. It still had sort of a joke, but, uh, 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 but they did. They picked up and moved north to South Dakota, and archaeological sites, many of them of that period, in North Dakota reflect that. They got up and moved, but there weren't a lot of people. They had a place to move to. There were, well, it had room for them. And I guess that's one of the things we don't have today, is we've got lots more people and there are lots more people living in places which, if we could pick up and move in that way, which we can't in a modern society, I suspect, where would we go? And the stories, I, th I think we're seeing stories on that every day. So the question in my mind is, um, this has been interesting, what's this, place called, what's this place called the High Plains going to look like in the future? And can it support a human population? Um, and that's what I'd like to pose to our, to our panel. What's it going to look like in the future? What's it going to perhaps look like or be like? Because we're going to talk about climate and uh, not only the physical on the ground, but also the climate, where the temperatures are. And, uh, uh, and what is this place going to look like in the future? Um, and uh, it sounds like it might be difficult thing to figure out, but what, what are your thoughts? And that's all I'm asking for. Your thoughts, not we're not looking for predictions so much as thoughts. 
Anybody want to start? Mike, go ahead. You're well, I'm holding the microphone, so the, 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 the I guess the, the sobering thought is this is not really. I would like to think that we just don't sit here and take it. Um, we have since we caused it, we should have something to do with fixing it. Um, it's a matter of it's it's getting to the point where it's almost too late to do something about it. But um, it is a human cause, and there ought to be a human human uh, correction for it. And you know, rather than just you know sit back and you know watch nature change like nature has always changed, um, there's a, you know opportunity to do something about it. And I'm not going to go into details of what that might be, but that's that's just simply my uh, take on it. Um, one of the uh, the most um, I guess frightening to me impacts that we are starting to see. It was, it's, we're, we're in a situation now where uh, we've always had extremes out here. It's just that it seems in many cases the extremes are becoming more extreme. Um, as a botanist, I came out here because I really kind of wanted to, to explore. That we have, um, you know, we live in the Great Plains, a, a vast grassland, but we have these little nuggets of vegetation that came from elsewhere. Like the, the Pine Ridge here is basically a little bit of montane forest at low elevation that has all kinds of species you wouldn't expect in the plains. Um, I came at, back out here, full-time position in 2011, was going to get started on this. What happens in 2012 is that a large part of the area that I was interested in surveying just went up in flames. I actually was able to get into a few places in 2012 just before the fires and then come back to them. Game and Parks wanted me to come back to these areas a few years later to see what had happened to some of the species we were tracking out there. Um, some of them did fine, some things did not. Uh, there were places where you could see vast carpets of boreal mosses underneath the pines. That's all gone. Those things did not survive. Um, there's a little uh, juniper out here called uh, dwarf juniper. Has little blueberries used to make a refreshing be uh, beverage you may have heard of called gin. Um, was all over the place. I went back to these areas, it's gone. And I, if you go back and you read the historical records, originally that was a rare plant out here. It was only found on the very steepest of um, escarpments where the fire couldn't get to it. Uh, so in a lot of ways, um, we're in some ways going to see the landscape go back to what it might have been 100, 150 years ago when fire oh. reasserts itself as, um, as an important shaper of our area, at least in the, in the uh, uh, wild lands. So, Sheila? Okay. Uh, I think in terms of, of wildlife, uh, I, I used to think that we would just have like cockroaches, coyotes, and pheasants. However, and white skeletons. And white skeletons. <laughs> However, um, if we're going to be dealing with these uh, climatic extremes, you know, like, I don't know, I'm, I've only lived up here for 16 years, but a lot of the folks that I talked to this past year um, regarding winter, and I, so I've asked them, like, have you ever seen anything like this? And they said no. Um, <laughs> Those types of events, I think, have the potential to do a lot of damage to our wildlife. I think most of the time, um, we, the wildlife, are going to be dependent on how the plants move. Um, and we're seeing, you know, species that have limitations in terms of tolerance of temperatures. We see them moving up in elevation. So the pika is a phenomenal example. Um, they can move up the mountain so far, <laughs> and then the mountain stops. Um, and we believe, you know, that uh, from a latitude standpoint, we're going to have species moving north. We're seeing that. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed the abundance of possums in the area. So we've got these southern, more southern species that are making these movements north, which works fine if you're a habitat generalist or a food generalist. If you're a specialist, it becomes much more difficult uh, because if the plants don't move and the movement rate is like, what, a meter a decade? Depends on the plant. Depends on the plant. Um, but if those specific habitat requirements aren't moving as quickly as the animals need to be moving, then they obviously would become extinct. So. 
You don't have the arm, 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 armadillo yet. No, but it's moving. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. we have it in Kansas City. Yeah, and so that is a species that's still considered to be endemic to the state of Nebraska, but I know that they do have confirmations of the species occurring more frequently in um, South Dakota now. Um, but yeah, so we've got this movement of more southern species um, that are making movements up here. Birds, they're having a really hard time adjusting, you know, from a phenological standpoint, especially those that are dependent upon flowering or fruiting of particular shrubs and trees. Um, so as they're making their migrations, uh, if they're not timing it correctly and not getting to these particular stopover sites when berries are being produced or when there's, uh, you know, fruit on the trees, they, they don't have the food resources to make the migration. And then you throw agriculture into the mix of it and the changes in the human population in the Great Plains also with agriculture and cattle prices and it throws in just this really interesting mix of what it's going to look like and extreme fires and anyway. And a lot of it comes back to water. Holly, did you have a question? You had your hand up. Can you? Um, there was a, an article in 2017 in Politico, and it's called the Great Nutrient Collapse. And it talked about the fact that the Great Plains and so it's creating junk food in our plants. And uh, so it's a theory. This, mm -hmm. this mathematician, uh, science biologist, was looking at. And so, you know, the question is now they're starting to take samples of rice and wheat and all these different things to find out are we just growing stuff. Because all the nutrient levels were down, but the sugar levels in all of these things were up. So if we're just producing, we might think, oh, this is the best thing in the world, the best carrot, but so I'm just curious if you've heard anything. Yeah, I know some folks have looked at um, what the effects of, uh, by setting up basically big, what are almost greenhouses and filling them with CO2. Um, and naturally, you know, plants, that's what they use to make food with. They do fine. We keep hearing things like oh, poison ivy really likes CO2. I've been seeing a lot more poison ivy all over the place, so maybe that's true too. But I think what's going on is um, in ecology, whenever you supply a nutrient or something that's beneficial to the plant, the ones that are the most competitive are the ones that are going to grab the most of it. Uh, so what you're going to see are the, the most aggressive, oftentimes weedy species are going to be the ones that are going to benefit the most. And consequently, they can therefore shade out and outcompete more desirable species. So um, same thing would be true with nitrogen. If you add a bunch of nitrogen to the soil, um, weedy plants might just, just go crazy and uh, knock the, the more nutrients you have in an environment, generally the less diversity, oddly enough, so. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, I, I, this is really interesting, but can I- Can you with, maybe stand up? I think people can hear a little better. Thank I'll you. use my teacher voice. Teacher voice, <laughs> okay. all right. Uh, with animals moving north, uh, what, can you talk about the diseases that they're bringing and how that's going to impact? Oh, yes, I diseases. can. She's asking about diseases that animals bring in as they move north. Oh, so are you, and you're talking about like zoonotic diseases? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this gets back to the pesky whitetails, really. So I know everyone is shocked by that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Matt can attest to this, but uh, so I have I have a major beef with white-tailed deer, primarily because they would have been a species that would have not historically been common. You know, there in the uh, Black Hills there was a subspecies Dakota ensis, very small version of the white-tail. But historically, because of the treeless nature of this system that we had, really west and outside of the rivers, we would have not seen the presence of things like white-tailed deer. So we would have had native species that were adapted to prairie environments, which would have been the mule deer, right? So then we get these pesky white tails coming out here, and they're bringing with them a whole host of diseases which are influencing other ungulates, so things like mule deer, things like elk, things like moose. So if you've heard of meningeal brain worm, so that's one of them that can, it, it does not have any influence on white-tailed deer, but it uh, is devastating for mule deer populations as well as moose. And then also very a lot of concerns too about species or things like Lyme's disease, right? So the primary carrier of Lyme's disease is actually white-tailed deer. Um, and so there are some of those issues that we're dealing with. 
And then I think sort of this, the front that exists between the, um, the interface of wildlife and humans too obviously is going to increase the prevalence of things like zoonotic diseases, you know, whether if we want to talk about, we don't want to talk about COVID, but anyway, so, but that's one of those, one of those discussions that's happening. And so, um, yes, I do think that there's going to be more prevalency. We're also seeing um, changes that are going on in terms of our insect populations too. And so like malaria um, being a situation now down in Florida. Um, so yeah, I would, I would suspect that, you know, the evidence of uh, zoonotic diseases is going to increase and be even more problematic. Last Sorry year, about the white-tailed deer comment. Last, <laughs> last year, we just about lost my brother-in-law, Benton, and I uh, had West Nile, and that's in uh, Howard County, central central Nebraska. Been thinking about going down to the pasture without his bug spray on. West Nile is in the hospital for I don't know how long, and uh, woke up a lot of people. So the change is something that, which we described here, is change has been constant in the high plains and nothing so what Mari will might be a good marker for a particular time in the high plains I don't know if those, those of you who really study her and pull much of that out of there but it, her, her life here her experience here was at a particular time 1900 to what 1935 1930 something like that uh, where an author has given us perhaps would you agree with this? Uh, uh, give us an insight into what this place was like at a particular time. Yeah. Any other authors that you can think of that have done that for the place? Uh, is anybody writing today that could be seen as doing that? It may not come to your minds, but that's a good question to leave in the line. Who out there is giving us a, 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 an image of this place today? Um, kind of a dystopian future here we could paint for this place. We can't pick up and move to South Dakota. Well, we could, but I'm not sure we'd be very welcome. Um, and, um, but this is all changed all the time. So what the, what the original immigrants saw 30,000, 20,000 years ago to what the Native American people saw 300 years ago to what the explorers, Lewis and Clark, sent back lots of records and made a lot of records of things that they found out here. Wonderful, wonderful resource. To what the early settlers, immigrants, uh, farmers, ranchers, farm, what they brought in, that's a different whole situation, to what we're facing today. And um, I think we, we really need to re rely on people like the three of you teaching our youth to try to make them under, help them to understand the complicated nature of nature. <laughs> of the natural world. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead, Daniel, and then I'll come back. Any questions about... Um, Stand up so we can hear you. Sure. I know the cattle, book, Mari's book, uh, not the cattle, uh, the mystery before, really, but there was a, uh, a very enduring mystery about the Alpali lakes. And so I'd be interested to know, you know, how those were formed, what are they, and uh, are we still around? It was just very interesting for me. Uh, yeah, and there was a section in uh, Old Jules about the uh, period during the Second, First World War when the German supply of potash was cut off, and so they started using the Alkali Lakes and Sand Hills to extract potash. Um, and it's just the, you know, the uh, uh, potassium sulfate in the in the water it just is a weathering product and. If there's enough moisture, it gets leached out of the sand and, and, and deposited in the lakes, and uh, it can be concentrated. And it's um, those, some of those lakes are pretty pretty nasty, you know, they're kind of salty, and so that uh, we're able to concentrate the brine enough to be able to mine the potash out of it. They were toxic to the cattle. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. So there's still um, areas north of here. Right in in Nebraska, but along the um, yeah, just directly north here, Shattered, in fact, where there's some leases uh, that still have very high alkali content, and so you're right, it is toxic to the cattle, and so um, they have to pipe in water or haul in water for people that are utilizing those landscapes for livestock. Mm -hmm. 
Catherine, did you have a question? Uh, just, just a quick comment, because Ms. Peters came up. <coughs> One of the main topics in the morning time, New York Times, is that we have been at war with mosquitoes for years, and the mosquitoes are winning. So, I mean, that, it was, mosquitoes are winning? Yeah. The mosquitoes are winning. There's West Nile. I thought Cutters was winning. We need more bats. <laughs> more, bats. <laughs> more bats. Well, that's great. Yeah. yeah. A little bit complicated. Uh, one of the things that Teresa mentioned was the short, short books that the University of Nebraska Press has put out, uh, a whole series, uh, Geology on the Plains, Weather on the Plains, uh, you mentioned one of them. Great Plains uh, Birds. Great Plains Bison. Birds, or Great Plains uh, Indians, I think they call the other. Um, there, if, you know, if you're not a specialist in any of this, they make a pretty good reading, pull, pull, pull those together. They also have some... Uh, uh, resources in them or suggestions in them for further reading, and I won't try to comment on whether the quality or not. But uh, but for a lay person, go ahead. They are quality. Um, there, there's also great Plains literature in Wishart's defense uh, because they are written for a popular audience. The authors are told quite explicitly no footnotes. Yes. So even though I'm sure he had done his research, he wasn't allowed a footnote. I'm sure. Yeah, I have um, Mike Forsberg as neighbors with Wishart, and so when I saw Forsberg at a conference, I said, ask him about this, and so he made notes, so he's getting back to me on it. These are good books. They're yeah, good, really books. good books. I, I've enjoyed it. And they have no footnotes, so they, you know how many pages it saves for a printer if you don't have to print the footnotes? Uh, right. Anything else from the audience? Other questions or comments? Go ahead, Mary Clay. What's Thomas? Farmers, my, my parents were reading that. They were very taken by that, um, by that threat, I guess. But it was very, you know, and something that uh, you see more of that kind of writing today than we did back in the 1950s when people were simply worried about the atomic bomb. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, I'd like to thank them for a very long time. And, uh, this, this really